Tonight, Lord willing, we are, we are going to start a five-part series on the topic of heaven. And I just want to, first of all, acknowledge Randy Elkhorn, because he wrote a book called Heaven. And that's, I used a lot of his stuff. Um, very well-written book, very scriptural. And uh, so I, I just want to acknowledge him. And if, if any of you get interested more in reading uh, about this topic of heaven, I'd recommend that book. Randy Elkhorn, it's called Heaven. <clears throat> but uh, let me just begin. Our life here is short. A person who lives an average life will live to be roughly 76 years old. Well, it seems like a lot of people are living older than that nowadays, but that actually is the average, 76. And someone who lives a very long life will, st will still rarely make it to 100. And so our life is actually quite short. The Bible says in James 4.14, 4, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We're just a vapor. We're a mist that disappears. Every second, three people die. Every second. 180 people die every minute. Nearly 11,000 per hour. 250,000 people die each and every single day. That's a quarter of a million people every single day. And that means that 250,000 people leave this life to enter either heaven or hell every single day. And that's something to think about. Well, let me ask you do, you, do you know if you're going to heaven? And if you're certain of going to heaven, are you looking forward to heaven? Or does it make you nervous? Maybe you haven't thought of that before. Colossians 3.1 says, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. We are told to keep seeking the things above, to set our minds on the things above. Yet there's some fears, even thinking about heaven. And this morning, well, I, I said this morning because it says this morning. See, I got my manuscript here, but I didn't change it to this evening. But let's just look and see if we can dispel them. There are actually three fears that are common for people to have, even about heaven. Number one, there's the fear of the unknown. Number two, there's the fear of boredom. And number three, there's the fear of the ethereal. And I'll talk about that in a minute, what that is. So let's just look at each of these fears. And, and you know, it's interesting. I've actually had people come up to me and talk to me about these fears before. So I know this is genuine. Uh, this was talked about in that book by Randy Alcorn. But I've had people talk to me about it. So I know this is a genuine thing people think about. So the first thing, let's just begin with, uh, with number one. Even thinking of heaven, there's the fear of the unknown. It's somewhat normal to be nervous about what we don't know. And so there's a fear of the unknown regarding heaven because not much about heaven is taught. How many sermons have you heard on the topic of heaven? I mean, we, we hear about hell quite often, but we rarely hear about heaven, at least not in depth. And though it's mentioned, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it is kept on a, it, it, it's not gone into too deeply too often. In Lewis Burkhoff's classic, classic system, system systematic theology. It's a 737 page book used in seminaries. I, I actually think it's, I think it's the best systematic theology book out there. It, it's, it's deep, it's a little hard to read, but if you like deep reading, really good reading, Lewis Burkhoff, classic systematic theology. Anyways, in that whole book, there's only one page on the eternal state. Heaven is unknown about it, partially because uh, what we can know about it is not taught, but not only is it not taught, there's verses that seem to say it's unknowable. And so why try to teach about it? For instance, 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, However, as it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. And, and this is true. We know that's true. We can't even imagine it. Yet, if we look at the very next verse, it says, in 1 Corinthians 2.10, but God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. 
The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And so God, through the Holy Spirit, does reveal much about heaven to us through, through the Word of God, as we're going to see shortly. So while it's true that there's parts of heaven so amazingly wonderful we can't imagine it, yet still the Holy Spirit has revealed much. Here's another verse that seems to say that we can't know much about heaven. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. This verse says those things that are secret belong to the Lord, and so leave them alone. It's kind of what it's saying. And, and, and there are secret things that belong to the Lord that we should leave alone. And, uh, but we look at this sometimes and think we can't know much about heaven. But the second part of this verse is often overlooked, and it says, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. And so God has revealed much about heaven in his word. John, Isaiah, and Ezekiel go into quite a bit of detail about it. So some verses seem to say heaven is unknowable, but when we look closer, those verses aren't teaching that heaven is completely a mystery. The Bible actually has a lot to say about heaven, but still there's also a fear of the unknown regarding heaven simply because we haven't been there. Imagine planning for a trip to a place you have never been. There's some anxiety, at least for me there is, not for my wife, but for me there is. I could just tell you stories about that. <laughs> I got to tell you one. Can I tell you one? <laughs> we had a foreign exchange student. You guys, some of you guys remember when we had Stefan. So I don't know if any of you guys even knew that or not. You, you, yeah. So Stefan from the Netherlands lived with us for uh, almost a year. I mean, he just became part of the family. It was really neat. And we st we're still in touch with him. And uh, so they decided to go out west. And you know, you know how my wife goes out west? Well, I'll just pack up the night before, throw it in the Suburban, and hey, let's take off. <laughs> they didn't even know where they were going. They just took off and came back, what, two, three weeks later? Something like that? Yeah. So that's... So she's good at taking off for the unknowable. Not me. Um, I like to know something about where I'm going. Uh, the more you know about a place, the better it is for a lot of people. Uh, you and I haven't been to heaven, so there's some anxiety over what it will really be like. And yet there is a truth we need to grasp. We can learn much about heaven, and we should. And Lord willing, we will. The Bible shows us more than than you might think. And so if you, if you have a little bit of fear of the unknown, I'll come for the next few Sundays, and Lord willing, we're going to dive into it a lot more. Now next Sunday is the 21st, I believe, right? So next Sunday is Judy and I, it's our anniversary. And so we're going to have our whole family over. So next Sunday night, we might have to skip one Sunday, and then we'll come back the next Sunday. You guys all good with that? So... So we're going to have a, a, a little break, and then, then we'll just take off on this, okay? And so, but the, the, the fear of the unknown, we'll see if we can just get rid of some of that if you have some uneasiness about it, because we're going to look at it, the, the whole point of that just right now, at least this initial sermon is to say there's quite a bit about heaven in the Bible. Lord willing, we're going to look at it. But here's the second fear, and people really have this fear, this fear of boredom, and and people wonder, well, what am I going to do in heaven for all eternity? One pastor, and this is weird. This is a quote. I don't even know where I got this. I don't know if it came out of Randy Alcorn's book or where I got this, but this is, this is just weird to me, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, it, wasn't, it isn't a quote. It's just something. He, one pastor said he dreaded going to heaven thinking about sitting around and playing a harp all day forever. I thought, a pastor really? Really thought that? I almost, I mean... You just got to know better than that. You're not going to sit around for all eternity playing a harp. And, uh, but this guy said he'd rather be annihilated in hell. And what that tells me is this guy has no idea about theology. And I, I can't even imagine. Whatever he's a pastor of, I don't know what he's a pastor of. But where do we get these ideas? Where do we get the idea of sitting around in heaven being bored, playing a harp all day, sitting on a cloud and going like this? Where have you seen stuff like that? You know where we see it? Movies. TV, cartoons, certainly not from the Bible. Not from the Bible, not at all. So, so we, we, we get these goofy ideas. 
It's a faulty understanding of heaven if you think you'll get bored, okay? Just it's a faulty idea about heaven. Paul said in Philippians 1, verse 23, But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. And then he goes on to say he also wants to maybe stay here and help you guys out. But um, he's he's hard-pressed. He wants to depart and be with Christ. And so he wanted to, to depart and be with Christ because he knew it was far better than being here. And so some people think it will be... Well, some people think it'll be one long eternal church service. Some people think it will be sameness, repetitious praise songs. But think about this. Could you ever get to know and understand completely the infinite God of the universe? No, he's impossible. All eternity, we won't completely be able to understand God. He's infinite. Do you ever tire? Has anyone ever here? I, I, has anyone here ever got tired of looking at the beautiful stars in the heavens? I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, I still, and I'm sure you still, go out on a on a like a wintry evening when they're really bright, and you look up and you just wow, isn't that true? And it doesn't matter how long you live, you never get tired of it. How about the mountains? I've only been out to the mountains one time. I get too weird around the mountains. But they're amazing. They're amazing, amazing. You, you look at them and they, they, you can almost, like when we went out there uh, a few years back, it, they, they almost just, it's almost like the gravitational field is different. You go out there and it's just like there's a force around them. They're so majestic. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? There's just a, it's amazing to just look at the mountains or just run up by Duluth, up on the North Shore and look at Lake Superior. I mean, there's things on this earth that are so beautiful that you just, it's, you just never get tired of it. And uh, just think of how God's word can grip you. You ever just been in the Bible and it just, it just grips you like no other book, no other, nothing ever has gripped you like that in your whole life. What will it be like to speak to the living God face to face? Bible says that's going to happen. What will it be like to walk with Jesus in the cool of the day? I mean, there's always going to be newness and there's always going to be freshness and there's always going to be learning and love and fellowship and adventure and excitement. We can't even imagine it. We can't even imagine it. But the Bible does say this, and what, what's in Scripture we got to take a hold of the scripture and just, what does it say? We believe it because it's God's word. And this is what it says, Psalm 1611. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Pleasures forever, pleasures for eternity. In your right hand, there's pleasures for eternity. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And so, you know, the, the, the Christianity is, uh, there's an experiential part of it. It's, it's uh, there's a way in which we can, uh, people can get really, really charismatic and really experiential in a way where they're getting off the rails and out of line with Scripture. But there's a way where people can become so the other way that it's like no emotion. And the truth is there's a lot of passion with Christianity. Isn't it true? I mean, you come to church and you think, I mean, you guys all know this. Sometimes you come to church and you just get filled with the inner joy. It's just amazing. I mean, isn't that something? Are you, or you're reading God's Word or you're hearing a sermon or you're just... The Lord just, uh, he, he, there's a passion and there's, there's an experiential emotion just being in the house of God. I love coming to this place. And what will it be like in heaven where the Bible says, in, in my right hand there are pleasures forevermore? I mean, what will that even be like? And so, 
One thing for, sure, for certain, know this based on what we just read in Psalm 1611. Heaven will not be boring. And anyone who thinks that way just has a, a misunderstanding about the eternal dwelling place of God. But there's one more fear that people have. The fear of the ethereal. And let me define this word. Ethereal, it means intangible, impalpable, light, tenuous, airy, spirit-like. It means no body, no world, ghost-like. And we sometimes think of heaven as a place of ghost-like spirits, nothing being solid like the earth, like our bodies. Again, where do we get those ideas? I think we get them probably from TV and movies and things like that. For a time, our bodies will be in the ground and our spirits will be with the Lord when we die. But will they be disembodied or will the Lord give us temporary bodies until the resurrection of the dead? It's a good question. Uh, listen to Revelation 6, 9 and just listen to some of the things this says. It says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And we just went through the book of Revelation, and we know this is happening right now. This is the fifth seal. It's going on right now up in heaven. And okay, so there's, there's souls under the altar. Again, this is a vision, right? But we know there's souls in heaven who have been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they have maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a, whole, a, a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Now it's interesting, if they are spirits, they're capable of doing things that we do with our bodies. For instance, they can talk to each other. They can talk to the Lord. They seem to be a little bit aware of what's happening on the earth. They can wear clothes. They were told to rest for a while. It's very likely that, that we may be given some type of temporary body until the final resurrection. The Bible doesn't say that's going to happen. But what's happening in heaven right now doesn't sound like a ghost-like ethereal spirit either. And so, some way, somehow, it's whatever the Lord's doing with this, it's not ethereal, tenuous, airy, light, ghost-like. It's not like that. However, God has it. It will be very good. And on the last and final day of this age, at the end of the world, the Bible says our very bodies will be resurrected and made glorious. Whatever's happening right now, not sure what's happening right now, probably some kind of temporary body, but at the very last day, the bodies will be resurrected. They will go from being as they are now, weak and perishable, to glorious and imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 says, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for the star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It's raised an imperishable body. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So whatever type of existence that we have when we die and are in heaven... We will be capable of speaking, thinking, fellowship, wearing clothes. And when our bodies are raised on the last day, we'll be joined to our new glorious bodies. We will be spiritual and physical. Heaven will be a place for physical, glorious bodies. It will not be a spirit-type place, but an actual physical place as it likely is right now. We'll have bodies like Jesus. We will walk on solid ground. We'll eat food. We'll have mansions that we live in. And so this idea, this uh, for, for anyone having a fear and an anxiety about heaven, fear of the unknown, fear of boredom, fear of the ethereal, um, the fear of the unknown can be conquered by studying God's word. 
Lord willing, we will. The fear of boredom is completely just a misunderstanding based on false ideas about heaven, probably from Hollywood. The fear of the ethereal is also unfounded. Heaven is an actual place. Again, we'll study more on this, Lord willing. Uh, we saw how there's streets of gold and there's gates made of pearls. We saw all those things. And we realized in the book of Revelation, all those are symbolic. But symbols always stand for a reality. So whatever the reality is, it will either be like that or something even greater. So let me give you an overview, though. We're going to go into much more de detail in the next few weeks, Lord willing. Heaven, as it is now, will be joined to this very earth. We'll talk about that. Heaven now is called the New Jerusalem in the Bible. It's an actual place. The earth and universe as we know it now, the Bible says will go under calamity and undergo calamity and destruction at the end of the age. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 talks about the earth being burned up and the universe. But God will restore them. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 talks about that. And the Bible says the new Jerusalem, which is the church, and heaven's also called that, will descend to the new earth, which is this very earth restored, and God will be with us. Let me go ahead and read this from Revelation 21.1. You'll be all familiar with this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And so heaven as it is now, there's a, when people die, they go to heaven right now. But heaven's not in its final state. On the last day, on the day of judgment, the Bible says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And that new heaven and that new earth, and we'll talk about this more, Lord willing, in more detail as we go, but this is just kind of an overview. overview. It's, it's going to descend to the earth. We will live in resurrected bodies on a resurrected earth with the resurrected Jesus Christ in our very midst. Some people want to go to heaven only because they're afraid of hell, yet they are also afraid of heaven. They just know it's better than hell, and it's amazing, but there are people who really think that way because it's just mysterious to them. And so if you've had any fears and anxieties about heaven, you just need to learn more about it. Psalm 1611 again says, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. And so... Let me just go into one more aspect, and this isn't directly about heaven, but it regards heaven. Is heaven our natural destiny? Is heaven our default destination? This is something we really need to consider. It's not, is it? In a poll for every one American who believes that he is going to hell, there are 120 Americans who believe they're going to heaven. So the, that's a big ratio, isn't it? 120 to 1. 120 would say they're going to heaven for every one person who's saying they're going to hell. And yet, and we, we don't know. We don't know. But Jesus did say in Matthew 7, 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Heaven is not our natural destination. We're, we're not automatically heading there. In fact, our default setting, if you wanted to say there's a default setting, would actually be, it would be hell. C.S. Lewis said the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts, just gradual. So what keeps a person out of heaven? In a word, it's sin. And really, the, the main sin it is, is the sin of unbelief. 
In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone's a sinner. All have fallen short of God's mark. And so hell's the natural destination of every person. Sin separates. We've talked about that many times. And sin separates man from God. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities have made a separate separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God is holy, he cannot, and he will not allow sin in his presence. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And the reason I guess I want to mention this is, as we talk about heaven, there's the great danger of, and I know there's, there's going to be people listening to this online, I don't know who's all going to hear this message. Um, but the reason I want to mention this is, as we talk about heaven, there's the great danger of, of a person assuming you're just going to go there. I mean, there's all these ideas that people just die and they see a big white light and, 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 and like everything is good and they, there's like just an assumption that when you die, everything's better. People die and, and you hear people saying, well, he's in a better place. And biblically, we got to be careful about that kind of language because that doesn't always match up with Scripture, does it? They're not always in a better place. And so there is a great danger of assuming a person can assume they're just going there. The only place a person just goes, that they just go, is actually hell. And so a person should not just hope and wait until they're on the other side of death to see if their name is written in the book of life. We need to know now, and we can know now, and we should know now before we die. So who will be in hell? Those who haven't received God's gift of redemption in Christ. Those who have refused to believe. After Jesus Christ returns, there will be a resurrection of the dead. There will be a resurrection of believers who will go to heaven and a resurrection of unbelievers who will go to hell. In John 5.28 it says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. And so the unsaved will be judged by their works because they're still in the covenant of works. That's when the Bible talks about pulling out the books. And these works will include sin. These people without Christ will not be able to enter in heaven but will be consigned to everlasting destruction. Hell will not be a place, and we're not going to talk a lot about it, but hell's not going to be a place where they're socializing. It will not be a place some people portray it as, a place to reminisce about their escapades on earth. It, it will be a place of darkness, a place of torment, a place of untold suffering. There'll be no good thing there, no friendships, no companionship, no adventures or anything with excitement or joy, no relationships, no love. Only loneliness and suffering, and no relief, no end. The Bible says in Matthew 3, 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? And those words, the wrath to come, the wrath will always be the wrath to come. When a person has been in hell 10 years, it will still be the wrath to come. And when they've been in hell for 50 years, it will still be the wrath to come. And when they've been there a thousand years or a million years, it'll still be the wrath to come. Dante, in his famous book, The Inferno, envisioned chiseled above the gate of hell these words, abandon every hope, you who enter here. And that just gives you the chills, doesn't it? There's people today who deny hell, even Christians. Many churches won't preach about it. And they may not realize it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself who in the Bible said more about hell than anyone else. Christ himself. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 40, So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9.43 says, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell in the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And so Jesus describes hell as a literal place, just as heaven's a literal place. Raging fires, the worm that does not die, darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth. In the story of Lazarus and the rich man, in Luke 16, Jesus taught that in hell the wicked suffer terribly. They're fully conscious. They long for relief. They they retain their memories, and they cannot be comforted. They're forever without hope. And so telling people about hell is... It's not a pleasant thing to talk about, but it is a loving thing to do. It really is, because it's the natural destiny of somebody who just goes through life and ignores everything. A good doctor will tell his patient he has a dangerous cancer and must be treated or he will die. And if he didn't warn the patient, he would be most negligent. Telling people of the eternal destruction of hell and their need to get saved is a loving thing to do. Teresa of Avila, a Carmelite nun, had an agonizing vision of hell. And she wrote of it. And I quote her, I was terrified by all this, and though it happened nearly six years ago, I still am, as I write, Even as I sit here, fear seems to be depriving my body of its natural warmth. I never recall any time when I have been suffering trials or pains and when everything we can suffer on earth has seemed to me of the slightest importance by comparison with this. It has been of the greatest benefit to me, both in taking from from me all fear of the tribulations and disappointments in this life, and also strengthening me to suffer them and to give thanks to to the Lord, who, as I now believe, has delivered me from such terrible and never-ending torments. End of quote. If we understood hell in the slightest sense, we would never take it lightly. We would never be at ease until we knew we were saved. We need Jesus Christ to save us. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so Jesus is willing to save. And I, I, I think I might be speaking to the choir here, but just in case, just in case I'm not, or for someone who's listening, God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take away your sins. Jesus became our substitute. He went to the cross. And God poured hell right on him. He suffered hell in our place on that cross. He faced and he felt the very wrath of God. It was poured out on him in the fullest measure for our sins. Jesus bled and Jesus died and he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And those who turn to him and trust in him for salvation will be saved. As it stands... Those who live this life, who never do anything, who never turn to Christ, their eternal future will be spent in hell. And so what will you do? Jesus said, Mark 8, 36, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The price for salvation has been paid. Jesus paid it all on the cross. Forgiveness is freely offered. Salvation is freely offered. It's a gift, but as a gift, it must be accepted. If you're offered a gift and you don't accept it, it's not yours. And so have you received the Lord's gift of salvation? Hell and heaven are very literal, physical, actual places, geographical, real places. And so it's up to each one of us. What will you do with Christ? Our life here is short. Every second, three people die. 180 people per minute. 11,000 per hour. A quarter million every day. Receive Christ. Or do nothing. That's That's the choice. Heaven or hell. What will you do? 
Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we're warned about hell. And Lord, we just thank you for the free gift of heaven, free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for being our Lord and Savior. And Father, we just uh, pray now you just uh, bless us as we continue to do, have discussion and uh, talk about these things. And uh, thank you for your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm not used to giving a sermon and then thinking, okay, let's have a kind of a discussion. So we're just trying a thing here, but let's see what happens. What would be some of the things on this earth that would be a taste of heaven? Love, yep. How about some very uh, specific things? I mean, love is specific, but what's that? Fried chicken. Fried chicken. <laughs> well, there is going to be a banquet feast. There is going to be a banquet feast. What's that, Jen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. When babies are born. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting you say that. I was actually thinking that too. When, a, when there's a, a brand new baby and you just hold a, hold a little baby against you and you feel this little warm breath breathing on your neck and they're just kind of, I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? There's a, we'll be innocent in heaven because all our, I mean, all, we, we'll be shedding this simple flesh, this simple body. We'll have a new glorified body. I, th- I think I've mentioned this before, but to me, for sure, for sure, the hardest thing for me to imagine about heaven is the idea of not having sin. I can't imagine it. I really can't because the mind I'm imagining it with is a sinful mind. So I, I don't know what a thought is like to be thought in a non-sinful mind. I just, I can't even imagine it. But there's not going to be any sin there. And so that's, yeah, that's something to think about. What are some other things that give you, that the Lord has blessed us with, that would give us just a a, a taste of His glory? What's that? Fishing and hunting. hunting. Getting out in the woods, right? (laughs) <laughs> do you guys find yourself when there's a uh, yes yeah yeah music and worship in church boy sometimes I know this happens to all of you sometimes the music that we're singing just the word that was spoken or the music or the combination of it it just it just moves you, like it brings you. It can bring you to tears. Um, isn't that true? It's uh, imagine what it'll be like in heaven. It's just angels singing, and you know, angels and and men and women and angels all singing. I mean, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys how I can sing someday, someday. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, they almost did, but they didn't want to wreck the music, so. <laughs> oh, But the music in church is amazing. So imagine what it will be like with all the saints in heaven. You know, one time down at Bethel Seminary, uh, it was almost all men there and, and, a, and a few women, and we had a class. They, they combined a few classes that day, so it was a whole bunch of men. And uh, I remember the professor had us all stand up. And we didn't have no instruments or anything. But we sang a cappella, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. <laughs> I just think about it, it can give me tears. I mean, it's unreal. All these men, these deep voices, these powerful voices, and many of them that actually could sing. And uh, it was amazing. Just this bunch of men just spontaneously singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So powerful. So we, we think, I mean, music is a gift from God, isn't it? really is a gift from God. Have you ever noticed, have you ever, you, you all have had this happen. I just got to believe you've all had this happen. But you see something so wonderful, so glorious, that you, 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 your kids are home, or your wife's home, and you say, hey, hey, come here, you got to see this, you got to see this, look at this. Isn't that true? It's like we just want to share the glory of, of a, a beautiful sunset or, or whatever it might be. 
and, and, and it moves us. And that is, I mean, we're just, God just made us that way, that we're amazed at those things. We see his glory. We see just a taste of, you know, what, what, what God has done. And, and we, it's so amazing. We, ha- we have to share it. We have to tell someone about it. We, we can't even help it. I mean, about the only time, I mean, Ginny knows I'll say stuff like, hey, you got to see this guy. You know, I try not to do that if she's sleeping. But <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, you, you see, uh, I mean, there's so, I mean I, I, every one of us could so, tell something amazing. I know it. every one of us could. I mean, I, th- I just think about um, sometimes in the summertime, it's nighttime out. And there's a storm, and the thunder just rocks the house. And you're sitting by a window and just watching the lightning. And it, I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, you just see the power of God in, in, in a lightning storm. I mean, I just think that's fun, especially when the house just is like it's just right above the house, and it just cracks. And it's, I mean, it's like those kind of things are. It's just glorious. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I mean, what's some of the things you guys have seen? What's some of the things that just yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. What else? Yes. Oh, man, yeah. The northern lights, isn't that something? When they really start moving, like just like curtains up there? That's amazing. Yes. I was telling you, uh, Montana one time uh, came up on a rainbow and actually could see both sides of the rainbow. Wow. That must have been something, huh? Wow. What else? What else have you guys seen that just... I've never seen it. Amazing, huh? Wow. See, you, know, you said a word. that was. You hear that? Breathtaking. God's glory in this world, even just in this world, that's a sin-cursed world that's been corrupted by sin, there's still so much of God's glory that it takes our breath away. I mean, how amazing is that? What's going to happen when we go to heaven? I mean... I mean, this is, this is God's creation cursed by sin. I mean, our breath will be taken away. There's no doubt about it. Can you think of anything else? Anything that just has just struck you guys like that? Something that you guys, hey, 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 look at this, look at this. One cell in our body. There's not a machine that's made by man on planet Earth that can come close to the sophistication of one cell in our body. That's a good one. Our body is amazing, absolutely amazing. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, you think about our body. How can how can this thing even function? How can this even work? It's it's amazing that uh, yeah. Just looking at people, just looking at the images of God, men and women. How can how can how can it even be? It's so amazing. That's a really good one. I mean, that, that takes on a little bit of new meaning for me just hearing this sermon this morning about the adoption. I mean, the, Dr. Rogers explained it so well. And, and you hear about the, it, it, the creation is groaning and we're groaning and waiting for the, our glorified bodies. I mean, we're sitting there talking about how beautiful this sin-cursed earth is. How is it going to be when the Lord restores it? I mean, that's... It's going to be amazing. That's a great verse. That's a great verse. It, it shows that anticipation, though. I mean, we're all waiting. And it says even creation is, you know, just, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah death really is the separation of body and soul. It's a, it's a cessation of life from, from animals that don't have a, a soul, um, or at least a spirit. Um, that's, a, that's a topic we'll even talk a little bit about the animals, too, as we go here. Um, but there's, yeah, death, the Bible actually says that, uh, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And what was death? What is death? Well, I think, I think, now that's the, 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 when it says, I think when it's talking about death being cast in the lake of fire, um, again, this is in Revelation. And so we got to be careful about the literature. It's it's talking death almost like it's a personification. This thing called death is being... Ca- but what it, what it really does mean is death itself will be no more. There'll be no more death. Uh, those in heaven are going to live forever. We have glorified bodies. 
bodies that will be stained eternally, sustained eternally by Christ himself. And so, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, death will be gone. So I don't, I don't guess, as far as the term, the word, there'd really be no use for it. It's not going to be there. Yeah, that's good. So if you hunt, there's going to be something different. I don't. So, now this is interesting because, because we think of, okay, we need meat because, and we kill an animal to get it. So I see where you're going. Um, yeah. Those are, those are the things that would be Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, right? We really, we, any speculation is sheer speculation. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know what will happen there, but we're going to eat there, but I don't know. Yep. Yeah, he ate fish. And so, um, and, and, he, and he had a glorified body. And so that's, there's mystery to that. But it, it's, uh, yeah, some of it, some of it we don't know yet. But, but we're going to, we're going to, there's going to be a, the banquet, the wedding feast. Jesus ate fish, like you say, and he was in his glorified body. And so, it's, them are good questions. I, I guess, I guess we'll have to wait and see, won't we? That's good. I don't know. I really don't know. But, but the Lord says he, you know, the Lord can, he could create meat there without having an animal to kill too. So we, the, those are, in all seriousness, all those kind of questions like that, that's where what we, what we really want to do with the topic of heaven is, is what does the Bible say? And whatever the Bible says, we can, we can grasp that and say, here's what the Bible says so we know this. And then whatever the Bible doesn't say, secret things belong to the Lord. So we really don't know. Now that's, yeah, that's a, you know what? People wonder about that. And um, it's interesting, Charles Spurgeon totally believed that, you know, we'll have dogs in heaven. And uh, Martin Luther actually has a quote. And I, and I wish I had the quote so I could read it because it's such a neat little quote. I'll butcher it, but maybe if someone looks it up at some point, we, we can get the actual quote. But he said, fear not, little dog you will have a golden tail up in heaven. <laughs> and so, it, anyways, it was, it was a, a really neat quote. Um, but we'll actually talk about some of that. We'll actually talk about that as we go here. So when people think things like that, all those things come around to showing what we were talking about tonight. One of the points was the fear of the unknown. Because there not there a lot we don't know? And so we, what we really need to do is we need to find out what we can know and lay that out so we solidly know this is, this is what we know about heaven. And we'll, we're going to find it's really, really amazing, really good, and probably more than we think. You know, uh, some of you study this, maybe some of you haven't. There'll be probably more to know than you think. Um, but there's just even our conversation tonight shows there's a lot of speculation about heaven. And, we, and we're, we're better off to not speculate too much. Although I will say, if someone thinks it's wrong to have dogs in heaven, I would disagree with that. I, um, but yeah, there's societies like that. But any other, um, when we think about heaven, um, just, just throwing this out there, we're going to talk more about this, and we won't go a whole lot longer tonight, maybe another, just, just a little bit longer, but what do you, we talked about this when we went through the book of Revelation. Just mentioned tonight, we'll talk about it more so we don't have to go very far with it, but what do you, have you guys ever um, thought about the idea that the Bible actually teaches that heaven is going to be on earth? Yeah. It, it, it actually teaches that. And that this restored earth, and so that means that we can get a glimpse of heaven right here on earth. Because these things we talked about earlier, we, 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 you see the beautiful ocean, you see the mountains, you see the stars, all the things that just are, that make you, you want to you just stare in, in awe and be amazed and, and, and tell someone, just look, look, see this. And, and, and that is a taste because we're going to be on this very earth and this very earth is going to be restored. That's what the Bible says. 
God made this planet for man. And so the idea, again, of, of heaven being some far off ethereal place out there that's airy and light and made of ether, ethereal, this like nothingness, uh, ghosts, all that, that's completely uh, not mentioned in Scripture. A, a thing as Christians that we probably don't think about enough is the Bible teaches the resurrection of the body. This body that you're in right now is eternal. It's going to go through a change, just like when you put a seed in the ground and a plant grows up that's different than that seed, but yet that seed is part of that plant, and this body, this body is eternal. This body is going to be sown in weakness and raised in strength. It's sown perishable and raised imperishable. It's still this very body. And so when, when our body is, when our body is uh, molders into dust and, and nothing's left of it, uh, yet when God calls, when the archangel shouts and the trumpet is blown, our molecules are going to come together. Our very body, some way, somehow, is going to come together. It's going to be these very bodies. They're, they're going to come together. And they're going to raise. The Bible says they're going to raise. And literally as we raise, we're going to, we're going to be transformed into glorified bodies. The Bible really does teach that. And uh, if, if a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of the religions that they practice in other countries that are not based on Scripture, that's some of the areas where we get the idea of spirit-like things and stuff like that, and uh, they, don't, they don't believe in stuff like that. I think the reason why, uh, if you go every single country in the world, every nation in the world, why they worship idols and why they worship different gods and why they have all this kind of stuff is because God put eternity into our hearts. And so man was made to worship God. And we have the truth because we have Christ, we have His Word, we have the truth. But even places, civilizations that don't have the truth, they're going to come up with something because it's in our heart to worship. Just that they're not worshiping the true living God. But this, uh, the, I'm rabbit trailing now, but the, this idea that our, our very bodies are going to rise from the dead. And so um, if someone's not happy with their body, they will be then. You know, um, because they're going to be made glorious and imperishable and beautiful and amazing. And, and, so, and yet we're going to recognize each other. We're going to be able to look at each other and know, hey, I, I, I know you. you know, that, that's really going to happen. So um, probably just close up in a minute here, but I just want to just, my mom, yeah, she worked at the, what was called Grandview Christian Home. And now it's uh, Grace Point, right? And she worked there for about 40 years. Um, that place, they built that in the very early 1960s. And my mom got a job there like almost right after it opened. And she worked there. She's the longest employee that's ever been there. And um, it was really interesting because she's working with all these people in the last, last years of their life all the time. And so she saw a lot of stuff that was interesting. She saw people right before they died many times. And uh, she, it was just amazing. To, to, she, she would, people would be, uh, they'd be hearing music, beautiful music. Or they'd be seeing just beautiful, beautiful things. And right before they die, and they would, they would even say things like that, like that transition from, from being in this life to the next life. And, and I mean, it's interesting to hear my mom even tell me about things like this. She saw it, and um, I know uh, a friend of the Larue family. Um, one of their friends died, and. Uh, that this this man was a Christian all his life, and and right before he died, I mean, he had cancer. He was really a sick man, and he was right before he died. He just lit up. And if I remember this right, and if I'm, maybe you maybe you remember this, Jen, but um, 
right before he died, he, he just lit up and he, and, he, and he said something to the effect, I see Jesus. And so it's just, uh, you remember that, Jim? I'll tell you about it. But uh, and maybe I was talking to Scott, but I'll, I'll tell you about it. But uh, just heaven is a, Psalm 1611 tells us that there's going to be pleasures at his right hand forevermore. And it's really something we can look forward to. And, uh, and it's something that even, you know, the, it's just wonderful to see people coming to church and hearing about Jesus. And, and we need to be lights of the world and, and sharing the gospel with people. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for that we could be here tonight. And just thank you for the fellowship, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, getting together. And thank you for the love of Christ being here. Thank you, Lord God, for loving us and saving us for the hope of heaven, for the sure hope of heaven. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, we're adopted as children of God and that our hope in heaven is certain. And Lord, help us to rejoice in that and uh, live in joy in that and share others, share with others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we just thank you for your word and we thank you for this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.